guys, it's been a long time. It's been a very long time. Uh, a multitude of reasons and excuses. Covid. Back trouble. Back trouble, yeah. Other things going on. Shit happening. But we're today, back. We're, back. we're back with a bang. Yeah. Um, what are we going to do today? Well, uh, this was your idea, Bob. Uh, this was your idea to look at red guitars. Well, right, we're going to bring you some red guitars. <laughs> and these are no ordinary red guitars. You've probably already spotted that we're playing a couple of red guitars. Yeah, and um, these are kind of like... Unless I decide to edit this in black and white, in which case you can be forgiven. Um, but I'm not. And these are particular, these are these guitars were kind of made famous by B.B. King and uh, Otis Rush, wouldn't you yeah, say? Yeah, I would say. You know, so that's why we started off playing... Um, the great song by the great Otis Rush, All Your Love. All Your Love. It wasn't, it wasn't Eric Clapton that wrote that song. It wasn't. He just played it rather well. <laughs> Contrary to uh, common belief. But uh, yeah, so I mean, these were like the kind of really majestic and beautiful um, and very rare because red wasn't really, was red the colour on, on this particular? So model, this, the, 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 red, the red was kind of customer orderable from yeah. Gibson earlier through, through the late 50s. Right. But didn't really turn up on many guitars. It kind of emerged in about 58, 59, in very small quantities in 58. And of the thin lines, which were only introduced in 58, it, the red turned up on the 355, which is the top of the range, sort of Les Paul custom style thin line. It turned up on that guitar first. And this is out of uh, 1959. That's 59. With, um, the, with, with the original gold Bigsby. Gold Bigsby. Um, although you see it's done it already, um, there, there is one issue. At the moment the strings are, for some mysterious reason, wrapped over the retaining bar on the Bigsby on this one rather than underneath it. So it's a bit of a pig to play, but that's just stringing. This is, this is top wrapping, but you shouldn't do it like this. Don't do this top wrapping at home. I mean, I do top wrapping on my Les Paul. There you go, but not like this. But anyway, it's, so it's originally gold parts. Were, yeah. these, these pickups were they gold or not? Yeah. They, right, so they've really worn evenly to what looks like a lovely nickel sheen now. But um, and by the way, we've got the owner just off camera here, but he's a lovely gentleman, great guy, great player, and the collector. So indeed, uh, indeed. And so what we're going to be seeing here today are all from his collection, and it's, yeah. it's, it's quite, quite toy time. So you can see here, like, they're gold. But these oh, it's got gold. a stinger. It's got a black stinger. Yeah, the and these are gold, but the, 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 these bits are silver. So they've kind of worn. They've off. worn a bit, yeah. And uh, obviously, somebody was sweating or playing a lot on. Yeah, on or song. just, or just, you know, a previous owner might have just polished it. So every, everything about the guitar seems to be original. It's it's, it's got the multiple bounds um, pick guard. The pick guard hasn't yeah. gassed off too much. No. Or, you know, what happens with these laminated pick guards quite often is they just change shape over time. They 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 tend to cup. Mm. And this one hasn't gone too much badly like that. The knobs, original knobs for the period. And water. This red is like a watermelon. And the red's faded to watermelon, yeah. which the, the early ones do. And it, this tends to happen on 355s of the period. It happens a bit on 345s. There are a few 335s that have gone watermelon, but very, very few. And mm -hmm. you know, the strange thing about these guitars, it's a bit like Les Paul's, is that the top of the range guitar, which this was, this is like the black Les Paul custom. And it wasn't yeah. the best seller, and it isn't the guitar that commands the biggest money today. The biggest money is lower down the range with the yeah. 335. But that's why B.B. King and these blues guys wanted to play these really ornate guitars, is because they wanted to make a statement. It showed success. Yeah, and it was, um, and with, as well with, with the, because, you know, this is one thing a lot of people don't realise is that you know, Les Paul was a, you know, a fan of Django Reinhardt, and he was a fan of jazz guitar. The jazz came, the big band jazz arts top sort of vibe. And um, and so that's why his favourite was the custom, yeah. with the with the ebony neck. Ebony neck. He only ever played a custom. He never and, played, and, he, and of course, he only ever played clean. Yeah, Mary Ford played the gold top. Yep. When he was married to Mary But then Ford. they both played, you know, clean, no he, no distortion. No. That was hideous. No, he was building a jazz solid jazz. Well, of course, the Les Pauls, the black Les Pauls of those days. I, I I don't know if these are are these, are these the fretless one the frets as well. They are. So they're very low frets. So yes. This is this is the fretless one neck as well. So again, it's not. It's not your blues bender's ideal guitar. No, I mean I can't because because of the way the guitar's strung, it's, they're going to pop out the saddles. But you know you you can that BB King. You know, so it's definitely got that. Yeah. You know that fast attack which you get from a Nebony fretboard. Yeah. Which BB King became famous for. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So that's that, and that's that's a beautiful beautiful piece. That you know that's one of the early top end. Thin lines. 
beautiful guitar in fantastic shape as well and just lastly uh, this is something the owner just told me um that the, when i expressed the fact that the neck has just got this incredible thickness and shape to it and it was obviously because it's a 59 neck yep if we explain we know why it's so it feels so good yeah it's just from you know the the pinnacle the classic period for gibsons particularly their electrics you know, and we're going to see some guitars that are from a slightly different periods, but you know, it's definitely you know about as good as it gets. So what have we got here then? Bob? So this this is a, an unusual guitar. Um, you know, Epiphones by this time, you know, late fifties, early sixties, they were made. They'd been bought by Gibson, and so Epiphones were being made in the Gibson factory alongside Gibsons. So this is, um, to all intents and purposes, a mixture of an Epiphone and a Gibson. It's got all the Epiphone ornamentation, but it's basically uh, the Sheraton. Uh, is uh, is this, a, I think, a 61? 62. 62. 62 Sheraton. So it's more conventionally cherry red, um, but it's a top 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 of the range guitar in the Epiphone range. So these are quite closely related, actually. Yeah, because, I mean, uh, from what I understand, is the, the Epiphone workers stayed in New York and all moved to Guild. And mostly the ones that didn't want to relocate, yeah. relocated to Guild, and the ones that didn't mind relocating went and joined the, Epi the Gibson workers. Right. So you know these were both made on the same in the same factory on the same benches. Um, this is kind of the, the, the higher up. I'm not sure it's the top of the range thin line or whether it's a higher up, but it's it's um, it's the Epiphone thin line. So it's got the mini humbucking pickups, which by the way came into Gibson through Epiphone. Mm -hmm. Okay, they were originally an is Epiphone. It, they were on the Empress. An right? Epiphone creation. Yeah. So so the, these are they on the Empress. The smaller pickups. They were New Yorkers, weren't they? They were um, only in Gibson made Emperors. Right. Mm. right. That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, now the neck on this one is slightly skinnier, as befits a 62, but it's still incredibly playable. The the differentiating thing about this neck, and this has got you know normal size fat frets, it's not a fretless one, but the uh, the the edges of these necks are bound, but they're bound in let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven ply black and white, so they're very fancy. Um, and I'm, I'm not, you know, on Les Pauls, I'm not mad about really thick neck binding, but on this, it just feels fantastic. Um, do you mind my saying where this came from? No, of course no. not. No. This, this came from um, the collection of a man called Alan Rogan, who is sadly no longer with us. Alan was um, a tour manager and tech support for many of the most famous bands that have ever walked this earth. You know, he did it for the Rolling Stones, he did it for the Who, um, he was a very big noise, and he, you know, in, in his spare time, he was also a serious guitar collector. And he passed away last year. Uh, and uh, most of his Les Pauls and his Telecasters, he had quite a few of those, and most of them have steamed back to America. Don't, don't uh, dwell on the Telecasters. Don't dwell on the Telecasters because oh, they should have been mine. Don't right. that ship sail? No, that ship has <laughs> sailed. That ship sailed, sailed off into Wonderland in terms of prices. So it's a gone day. Um, well. But uh, he also his his particular favourite. He loved Epiphones and he loved um, he loved Sheratons. He loved Coronets uh, as well. The solid body Les Paul Junior type thing. Actually, there's a guitar that we do have to get out today, which I've just remembered. We have to get the Wilshire out because it's beautiful. So he also liked Wilshire's, which is the Les Paul Special. That's coming later. Uh, so anyway, that's uh, that's where this came from. Um, I love this guitar because just acoustically. This is one of the liveliest mm -hmm. uh, Gibson semi-acoustics I've ever heard. This acoustically for me, this thing beats yeah. that into a cocked hat. It's this is really, really nice. I mean, this is way nicer acoustically than my 59 three, uh, three, three, five, for example, mm -hmm. which is otherwise a pretty fantastic guitar. So uh, again, uh, very similar. You know, you've got uh, uh, a mahogany neck. Um, you know, with a cherry finish. Slightly slimmer, isn't it? Slightly, Slightly slimmer, slimmer. Sli slightly slimmer and flatter profile. Grover tuners, again, like you would get on the top of the range mm -hmm. instruments. Um, this guitar has a particularly nice uh, mid position with the, the pickups sound sort of out of phasey, but they've still got some body. They don't, they don't just go all thin. Um, and the other thing about it, you, you have to say the headstock inlay is just, just a piece of work. And it's just you know, really, really pretty. Which is carried over from the older, it is original, from the fifties stuff. I mean, there's a lot to be said. You know, obviously, you know, guitar players and collectors are incredibly conservative, and they, they they tend they tend to buy Gibsons and they tend to buy Fenders, and I, I'm probably as guilty as any. But there's a lot to be said for looking at Epiphones for this. From this don't, don't tell anyone. 
Until I bought my one. Okay. Don't. I'll say it so everyone can't hear me. But uh, the Epiphones from... Don't buy them. They're not very geeky to Honestly. They, they fall apart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. They're, they're amazing. The, the, the Epiphones from the 50s are some of the best made guitars in guitar history because that factory was on fire. And they got taken over by Gibson. Gibson managed to import most of the good bits and they didn't manage to add too many of the bad bits. So the Gibson made early Epiphones are bloody fantastic as well. Um, and most of them, with the exception of the Epiphone Casino, which, because of the Beatles connection, is more valuable than the Gibson 330. Apart from that, Epiphones tend to be a little bit cheaper. Although, although that said, I've noticed Norms is now putting huge prices on his Epiphones, you know? Don't get me started, because the truth is, at the moment, <laughs> dealers are putting huge prices on everything. One of my bugbears at the moment is that if you see a dealer interviewed on, online these days, pick a guitar. Let's pick a Telecaster. No, bitter? No. I'm not bitter. But seriously, you pick a black guy on Telecaster and a dealer will say, yeah, $40,000 guitar. And I'm going, that's about right. That's about what I'd pay for one, for a good one, you know, good shape, verifiable. You find me one on offer for less than 65. So it's the same dealers offering it to the public at 65 and telling you that the guitars are worth 40. Not that they pay 40 for it, but it's worth 40. So you're going to a shop and a bloke's saying it's worth 40 and I'm charging 65. And that's why I was trying to avoid the subject of telling And that's, and that, and that's the, the other thing is I'm told by friends of mine in the States who are in the know that all the dealers are now doing something that, that hasn't happened routinely before in guitar collecting, which does happen in antique collecting, which is that the dealers are all now buying from each other. And what that's doing is you've got a double cost spiral, you've got greed and internal buying spiraling the costs. So gentle reader, unless you are made of money, now is a really tough time to buy a vintage guitar for cash. Part exchange, different, because you're converting silly money into silly money. But if you're converting sensible money that you could spend on, I don't know, in, in the UK right now we need money because we, we can't afford our heating anymore because heating is more expensive than platinum. So if you want to turn sensible money into silly money, buy a vintage guitar right now. Otherwise, don't touch it. Wait for the market to come down because it must. Here ends today's sermon. Shall we move on? Yeah, sorry, I just, uh, yeah. They But it's red. It's red, very rare, and this would be a custom order. And probably quite an expensive piece of kit, custom order, yeah. all kinds of bits. It's got Veritone on it. Yeah. It's got the most fantastic flame maple across the body. But this is the guitar in blonde that Chuck Berry played. It is. So well, it was his, his might have been a year or two earlier, I don't know. Probably had P90 pickups on it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. But so, I, think, I think there's a shot of him playing one with a humbuck as well. Could be, you know, um, with the P90s. And then the obviously you had a red, you know, yeah. red three, five, five. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I've definitely seen him play a blonde one with humbuckers. So, but what's interesting about this is this is a laminate, beautiful laminate um, top on this, and just look at that, that flame maple. Now tell me the story about laminates versus solid tops. Well, so uh, basically, I mean, as far as I understand it. Um, if I take Jim Hall as an example, when Jim Hall went to Dear Kisto um, and Jim Hall replicated his um, ES-175, the main thing about it, it, it was a laminate guitar, you know? Because if you're a, a gigging jazz guitar player, you don't want to be, you know, taking an all solid spruce top, solid guitar where 
the thing goes out of tune on every gig. You, you play an outdoor concert and the, the whole action's going to change, you know, because it's a solid guitar, so it's very susceptible to what's happening. I th well, I, and I thought something to do with feedback as well? For feedback as well, the laminate's going to dampen the guitar, less resonance, so you can play the, the guitar louder, you know? But the, as well, you know, playing a, a solid arch top, um, they change action every day, right? Depending on the weather. so the wood so, really moves that much. Yeah, interesting. So the laminate guitars. Are See, much not being a jazz player, I, I don't, I don't really know about stuff like that. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. so I mean, I would always go for a, a laminate for you know, I'm doing a little jazz gig tonight. Yeah, I'm taking my laminate Fender guitar. Your Decousteau. Yeah, which in itself is not an inexpensive piece of kit. No, but so the laminate. I mean, for Chuck Berry, you know, he's doing gigs and that. It's it's, it's a workhorse. You know, he's he, right. You know, this is. This is, these are the days when... He packed it next to, his, next to his pistol in case he didn't get paid. Yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. just like B.B. King Rose's Rush, this was the time when the guitarists had one guitar. Yeah, yeah. They never, even which, they carried, which they carried themselves, tuned yeah. themselves, probably restrung themselves. No, yeah. no techs one and all guitar. that stuff. None of this Ponzi luxury of today. It was no. a proper working man's work. Yeah, they had, they had a cable and a guitar. God, I know how they feel. That's all they had. You know, That's, all I, That's all I get when I have a gig. <laughs> At least you've got me to tech for you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, so but this on the other hand, this is kind of like one up the level, isn't it? Well, this this is this is a uh, also 1959, uh, and the sharp eyes out there would have spotted this is a Birdland, uh, so named after Billy Bird and Hank Garland, so Bird and Land of Garland. Uh, they co-designed this guitar. Birdlands are known um, in recent years; they're really known because Ted Nugent played them. Right. Um, but he kind of ruined the image of them, didn't well, he? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> as, a, as a serious guitar. A gun-toting good old boy, you know. <laughs> but, no, I mean, he was cool. I mean, he was, the, yeah, the, the cool thing about him was that he used it for high ups in rock and roll. Yeah, and very really high drive, high distortion, you know, yeah. which, which is just keeping one of these things in, in check with that shit going on is yeah. pretty yeah, heavy. It's but, admirable. But uh, the Birdland is an unusual guitar as well because it's shorter scale and the neck is slightly smaller. The whole thing is smaller because I think... Because you've got short arms, haven't you? So it fits... No, I don't. But no? Bird and Garland, apparently, they must have been small-handed chaps. Oh, right. Okay, and you know what they say about small hands and small feet. And we won't go there because I think we covered that in the previous video. Yeah. We, yes, we, we did. We, 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 but can I just say this? Uh, another thing is that um, I think when they marketed this guitar, it was as well, you could... Do fancier jazz chords, you know. You could do the one biggest strips. Yeah, so yeah, you could. could show off and do these crazy. For sure. You know what I mean? Like yes. I'll just demonstrate one of those chords. I mean, I do it like this. I kind of. So I have to use my thumb, and you know what I mean. That's so that's certainly cool. that's certainly not a chord from the bottom of the pit. <laughs> well, you know. a quater mass chord. So this, this guitar was artist owned. This was owned by a chap called Buddy Long. I don't have to look very hard to see that, Buddy Long. Buddy Long was a band leader um, who uh, boasted Duane Eddy as his guitarist uh, at one point. Um, but ended up his career, he forewent uh, being a band leader, probably because it was too much like hard work, just like organising a band of gigs today is hard work, and ended up in Waylon Jennings' band as his bass player. Where you know life was probably more consistent and easier. So probably Dwayne Eddy has strummed a few chords on this guitar. Uh, I guess it might have been touched by by you know touched by God. Uh, you know twin uh, path humbuckers from '59, uh, gold plated, nickel showing through underneath, uh, or actually steel showing through underneath where the gold plate's worn off. Gold plated parts, period correct knobs, veritone, uh, pickup selector switch with a rubber grommet, uh, which was you know unusual in those days, but apparently. Finding these things on the second-hand market apparently is one of the the current memes or tropes of the day. Apparently, they're really, really, really hard to find. Now, this this guitar is also on the back. It's got a lot of quite serious action going on. There's a nice piece of flame maple for the back. The neck is extremely noisy. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of tiger stripes all over the neck. And again, we've got a black stinger on the back. And um, these really nice tunes. Beautiful tunes. What are these tunes? Um... They're kind of like Art Deco sort of... Because they're not your Gibson Clusons and they're not your top of the top end. Clusons Deluxe, are they gross? Are, are these... Clusons, yeah. Clusons Deluxe, so they're, I mean, so they're... Yeah. But they're, they're, they're quite, they're quite, you know, quite over-engineered. I think they had another name for them. Um, I think... They're not Imperials. No Imperials. Steel oh, Fars, the Clusons Steel Fars. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. And I mean, this, the, this one here, in contrast, this has got the... the that's Clusons. 
this was when they were discovering plastic. So a lot of the plastics are quite unstable. Yeah. And, and you know, some of them have lasted really well over time. You can find one guitar from 59 where they're fine, and the, its very next neighbour is just turned to biscuits. If you could flip your guitar over like this, which, what's really interesting about these two guitars is you've got the stinger, and you've also got this sort of segment of wood going in all the way through the neck. Yeah. Which is both sort of the same. Um, and then obviously the difference here is you haven't got the sort of cap on the heel. Yeah. Which is. So you, exactly that goes through. So I mean, does does that mean that this is actually a multi-piece? Yeah, multi -piece I guess it, yeah. It, must, it must be to cover the joint. Yeah. But the thing about this the guitar, guys, is it's literally brand new, isn't it, Bob? It's it's absolutely mint. Yeah. It's I, I mean, it's it's, it's kind of you know it's what what the collectors call museum. Yeah. Mm. And it's quite it's nice and light, and you can just imagine you know Chuck Berry. <laughs> And you know, with and very rock and roll was invented that, that, it on one so of these that, that guitar's got a truss rod cover saying stereo. So my guess is that that is a stereo guitar. Yeah, with the because oh, both of these guitars have one of these. Right, they have Veritones, but yeah. I don't know whether this is this is stereo as well. No, it's not. It's this is a, that's, that's a, a Veritone model. Right. So, but but in terms of scarcity, I mean, you know, the whole point of having all these these ancient, you know, Gibson red guitars today is that these guitars are all extremely scarce. Yeah. So. Which one, one of these are reckoned to be half a dozen of that one? Or this oh, one? That one, that one? This one. Apparently there are six known red burglars across the, the life of the And bird. it could be that these were sprayed red on the same day, in the same booth by the same guy. So how about that? There you go. It could be. I mean, you know, and, but, I mean, th these, and, and do we have, have we got any idea how many red 350Ts there are? One. One. There's only one of these. There's one of these. That's it. One. That's it. Okay. You know. So if you're anywhere else in the world, I can tell you with certainty you are not in the room with a guitar like this. this yeah. to, to have one of anything is pretty pretty astonishing. So this is this is like I was saying, this rock and roll was invented on, on one of these guitars. Do you know what I mean? These are real these are real time pieces. You know, if, if it wasn't for this guitar, there would be no Rolling Stones. And with that in mind. There would be no Beatles. There would be you know for the sake of you know, for the sake of our dear viewers, you know, flagging interest, we're going to move on because there's much more. Yeah. Going. Okay, guys, what have we got here, Bob? Right. So um, here, Bob? I did promise you. I mentioned it. It's a bit of an afterthought. I hadn't man hadn't intended to put it in this video, but I just suddenly thought we're here and this guitar's here. So I thought we'd better feature this one. This you really bonded with this. Haven't you? I love this guitar. It's 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 fantastic. I mean, it's it's fantastic at every level. It's an Epiphone Wiltshire from about sixty one. <laughs> So it's basically, if you're familiar with the Epiphone Coronet, which is like a Les Paul Junior, then the Wilshire is the two pickup, four knobs, pickup switch version, which is like a Les Paul Special. Uh, from the period again, where Epiphones were made on the same benches as Gibson. So the only thing is, this has the Epiphone body shape, uh, the sort of shell back wing uh, pick guard with the E, and obviously the Epiphone shaped um, headstock. Um, being 61, it's still got the metal plate, so a bit like my ES230T, which is just early enough to have the metal plate. They changed it in early 62, in the 62 catalogue, which came out in April. All the guitars had Mother of Pearl, all the cheap guitars had um, Gold Stencil. Um, so that's a bit of the period thing. This has got a wide, flat neck. Brazilian rosewood. Brazilian rosewood board. Honduras mahogany. Honduras mahogany, body and neck, yeah. but obviously a glued in neck. Quite wide and flat, characteristic of that period, 61. Guitar plays like the wind, but the condition of this guitar is absolutely standard. And the tunematic, which the others didn't have. And the tunematic. The Gibsons didn't have. No, indeed, they had a wraparound, of course. Yeah. Um, so this has a tunematic. So it's fundamentally, it's a, it's a slightly more usable guitar. And Gibson P90s. And same P90s as Gibson used, yes, so Gibson P90s. Uh, this P90 is uh, back from the neck, so this, this is obviously li like they moved this pickup on the specials during 61, 60, 61. They moved this pickup there because when this pickup was right next to the neck, the neck tenon underneath was too weak and these guitars were famous for snapping off at the neck. So this is one of the slightly later designs where the neck tenon goes deeper into the guitar, thicker, and therefore the guitar is more stable. Is if you have a look at the knob, if you have a look at your knob here, yes. what would the original colour be? What would the original colour? 
Would it have been white? Well, would it have been white? It's like this one. Uh, I don't think so. I think it would have been yellow, but not it's just yellower over time. And right. and marks out of ten for the material that they're made of. Um, nine. Catalin. Catalin. Oh, right. so, uh, so there you go. Uh, there you go. This is the kind of knob that idiots pay many hundreds of dollars for to put yeah. on their old Les Pauls. Because I'm thinking it was white originally. I'm thinking they would have been white. paler, but they wouldn't have been pure white. Are you sure about that? Because I've seen photos in the Les Paul book yeah. where they're white. Really white? But it might be because of the filters they're using. Yeah, yeah it might be. And I mean, remember, a lot you know, the of the Japanese guy. Well, the other yeah. thing is, a lot of, you know, a lot of the period illustrations, remember, were actually, they were like, the, 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 and, and they were like scraper board. They, they took a photograph and then they made a scraper board so that the black and white relief, the black and white right. catalogues were sharper. I see. So, an awful, you, you can't really... Trust a lot of the pictures from back. Question, there. guys, put it in the comments if you think if you know the colour of the, what they originally were. Put it in the comments. I think it's why Bob thinks it's off white, off, off white, and then they yellowed over years, like a cream colour. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. That would be that would be my my best guess. There you go. But uh, there you go. So that, anyway, that's uh, that's this guitar, which is an absolute peach. Um, this again came from the Alan Rogan collection, uh, and boy, did he have good taste in Epiphones. Wow, wow. Now as for that. That isn't even the Gibson. No, here we go, Bob, we've got, this is a beautiful, what we call a D400, and this was a Dwayne Eddy um, guitar, signature guitar, because they're signature guitars, um, and this is a beautiful Guild guitar, and, uh, and it's, it's almost kind of like Guild, in a way, Guild version of a 350, you could say that, you know? And so the cutaway, it's, it's you know, thin, it's not a full depth kind of arch top style yeah. guitar. Um, but, but you've got, again, slightly thinner than the 350, slightly more like a, a thin, yeah. line, thin line Gibson. And you've got this classic gilded mahogany that they used where they had the stripes. Yeah. And so this is a mahogany back instead of like a, a maple back or whatever. You know, yeah. This is kind of interesting for gilded. Quite nicely arched. Yeah. And the, all the gilds have these beautiful sort of pressed tops, don't they? That, that kind of a nice shape. And the, the best pickup ever made is on this guitar, which is. The Diamond and Dinosaur. Dinosonic? You know, so it's just got You know, it's great yeah. sound. And um, you know the I mean we had Tim Powell's, didn't we? You, you did great in yeah, our previous video. And so today you were in the doghouse. There was I was I was, I was a band from the show, but but Tim would tell you that um, you know this was one of the best models ever that Guild ever made, and it's quite pricey on the second-hand market. Always going up. Yeah. But um, and nice uh, these um, what are these? Uh, Kolb. Kolb tuners <laughs> with a really nice sort of see-through sort of bit where you turn it with your fingers, you know. And mother um, of pearl, mother of pearl buttons. Yes, and we've got that kind of pin stripe that we had on the 350s. Yeah. Um, so maybe, you know, the Guild the guild guys were looking at the, the Gibson, you know, what they were outputting. I mean, you know, my, my, my view about Guild guitars, especially modern Guild guitars, is they're very often better made than their competitors. There's something about Guild, they, you know, because they're, they're an also run brand, they have to try a bit harder. Yeah. But all these guitars are from a time when all these companies were making just Pretty bloody fantastic guitars most yeah. of the time. It's not to say that you still can't get a dud. You can get a dud sunburst Les Paul. Sometimes, just not very often. But all the guitars we're playing today, I mean, they're all they're all easy to pick up, easy to play. They're very friendly. Um, another little point about this guitar, which is quite an interesting point of discussion, is some like our friend Tim Perry, who's a guild collector. He prefers a, a wooden a wooden bridge, but. But this is a, has the uh, aluminium Bixby bridge, which he came with. Which he came with, and I actually really like the sound of the aluminium Bixby. Bridge. It makes it brighter. Yeah, with these dinosaurs, yeah, it's yeah. a great combination. I mean, but you can see why Tim would like the wooden bridge because Tim is a classical player, so he's used to a slightly mellower tone from his guitar. Yeah. And the way, even the way he plays, yeah. is you know he, he gets a lot yeah. of projection, but he also he goes yeah. for that mellow sweet. He doesn't go for the sharp. No, no, he's not. Stuff. He's not playing with the petrol no. as well. So. <laughs> And, and it's kind of, I mean, you can play literally, uh, like the 350, you can play anything rock and roll on this. And Dwayne Eddy was the kind of rock and roll country dude of his time. So, 
you know, and, and it's great that these, these kind of early rock and roll players had these beautiful, you know, yeah. thin lines, well not thin lines, but, you know, smaller yeah. F-holes. I mean, give us, give us some bottom string stuff, because, you know, Duane Eddy was the master of the <laughs> It ought to be able to do the twang, yes. and it's got the twang. It has, it has, and, and this is especially yeah. these this, and these, yeah. yeah. Because with this, you've got that sort of real rock. <laughs> Heavy stuff, mind you. Yeah. A couple of months ago, you were waxing very lyrical about your gold foils as well. <laughs> no, but even when I had the gold foil pop, I love gold foils, but I I knew that these were the best. So I've only, are, I've only got one, one pair of these. I mean, which let's is, ask you now. What are the best pickups ever made? Right. Sonics. There you go. Yeah. So I've only got one pair of these myself, which is on my 56 Guild Dewar Jet, right. which is a guitar that I put down oh, sometimes for quite a long time. Every time I get it back out and I plug it in, I go, why don't you play this more often? Because it sounds fabulous and it's got the black top versions uh, of those. Have you, uh, have you geeked the guitar, your bridge? I have. What does it sound like with these big up? The strange thing is I took it out on a blues gig. Right. And you would just think, wrong place. Why would you do that? And it sounded terrific. And they cut through, don't they? These pickups oh, cut through. Yeah, really, They're really, just like, really good. It made, made me you know, wonder why I don't take it out more. And the reason I don't play it more is just because got too much choice, but that's for another day. Well, we, we all have too many... Talking of choice, let's move on because we've got yet more fantastic red guitars to come. I, bro I broke a, a flat wound on my cheap bass. Yeah. I, for some reason, the bottom string unraveled. Yeah. yeah. So I broke the thickest string on in the world. Yeah. And then I went online to find out how much a flat wound bass string was. Yeah. It was 19 quid. Santa, eh? Psychedelic version. Ah. So we've got uh, two Gretsch red guitars. Yeah. So if, if they're black, they're Jewish jets. So if they're one? silver, they're silver jets. And if they're red, they're jet firebirds. Jet firebirds. Right? So right. there's only red jet firebirds. Like, there's only black Jewish jets. There's a really... There's a, there's a re Apart from the green one. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. these are both uh, Gretsch's. That's earlier, because that's a single kind of way. This is a little bit later. But these later. are both later than the Diamond version. They are both later than the Diamond. So yeah, the, these Good will be, I'm, I'm guessing that that's, that's going to be late 50s, mm -hmm. and this is going to be early 60s. That would be my guess. Yep, that, that would be characteristic. So that's probably, it's got the thumbnail inlays on the top, so this is like George Harrison's Black Dewar Jet was. So that could be kind of 58-ish. Yeah? And this, well, this has got thumbnail inlays as well, but this is, this is early 60s. Right. Both with filter strong pickups. Yours are silver, mine are gold. Beautiful. The only, the only um, 
That just reminds me of ACDC for some reason. The same. Sorry? It's the same. Angus. That's what Ma Angus. Yeah. Or Malcolm. Was it Malcolm? Oh, Malcolm. Okay. Ma Malcolm yeah. played the rhythm guitar. Rhythm player. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think with this pickup taken out. Yeah. Cool. yeah. It's just, okay. So he's kind of yeah. doing a Les Paul Jr. thing on a Gretsch. Yeah. Yeah. And I think mm -hmm. he had some of the buttons taken out as well or something. Because you've got a lot of, a lot of stuff going on. And, you know, one of the world's great rhythm players. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. Totally yeah. consistent. Yeah. Totally dependable. And, you know, with a tone. And another thing about these guitars, they're nice and light. You know? They're nice and lightweight. Because they're, they're hollow. They're, they're, hollow. they're chambered. Absolutely. Well, they're not even chambered, actually. They are hollow. They're hollow. I think. Okay. And interestingly, again, we've got the big speed bridge on here. Aluminium, big speed bridge. Yeah. And on your one, we've got a roller bridge, haven't we? This is a roller spacer bridge. So, so the Gretsch, you know, the interesting thing about Gretsch at the time mm. was that almost every batch of guitars that they made, they were fiddling with them all the time, so they're very seldom the same. Yeah. They were changing all the parts. I mean, one of the things Gretsch is famous for is all these switches. Yeah. It takes about a week to work out what the damn it's switches are. You've got the master, haven't you? Here? And you've got master, yeah. master volume, and then a couple of but, volumes here. But this has got a very interesting bridge, hasn't it? So yeah. is that, that's a Burns. It's a Burns. Song, it's like yeah. the UK, the UK um, Hank Marvin. You know, the whole... Um... Originally, the, the, the stop tail versions of these guitars had a Melita bridge, right. hugely over engineered thing. But it was basically. That's what's on your one. That's what's on mine, like yeah. a tunematic. Yeah. Okay? But then they decided that the, the, the issue seemed to be there was this guy who worked for him, he was like a demonstrator and a kind of a hell of a player, but a bit of a mad genius. And he kept on wanting to change everything. And he decided that the issue wasn't intonation, because on this guitar you can't change the intonation except by moving the whole bridge. Right, right. Like an answer. But instead, the whole issue was string spacing. Ah, I see. And so these, so basically, all these these um, uh, the, these guys for the strings are mounted on screw threads. So you 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 move them side to side. So you can change the, the, so you can change the string spacing, which is great. But you, you can't, can't change the intonation. Ah. Uh, but the, so the, these these are two again. You know, red red is not perhaps as uncommon as some of the Gibsons we've seen in this video. Mm -hmm. Um, because at least this, this guitar did actually have a, you know, a model name for red, which was a Jet Fire. Right. But these are still unusual. These yeah. were much commoner in black. Yeah, there's a great guitarist in New York, and he's, he's, he's kind of very much like a Mark Ribo sort of Ribo player. Mm -hmm. and, and he does these kind of, um, you know, I think he, you know, kind of like, um, was it a film noir soundtrack y sort okay. of style? You know, soundtracks, right. scoring. Very vibey. Yeah, and he actually writes scores for films, and, and so he's got all that kind of, um, you know, sort of. Yeah, that kind of vibe. And, um, and he, he bases his whole career on one, and I can't remember his name, but uh, I'll put it in the description because it's a great, amazing. Uh, I discovered him a couple of years ago, and it's like my, one of my favourite guitar players. And he's very much from Mark Rybo, who I love mm. that kind of vibe. Mm. And he, his whole career is on one of these guitars. Huh? You know, he's a great player, New York great player. And um, a red one? Yeah. I think it is a red one, yeah, if I remember rightly. But he, you know, um, so these are great, you know, beautiful, you know, workhorses and, um, you know, not less ball prices. So, you know. Although, I mean, yeah, they're, 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 like everything now, they are getting a little bit steep. The, yeah. the other thing is the, these, these Gretches, the, the, the necks, they, they definitely, you, you're not playing Gibson, you know that. You're not but, playing it the but, Gibson, but they're great. They feel yeah. they feel fantastic. They just maybe take a few minutes to get used to it, and yeah. once you're there, you're off. You're fantastic. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And they, they because they're hollow, they have a slightly springier feel to them, a bit like a yeah. little a little bit arch toppy and not so solid body. Yeah. yeah. You know. But it, it, they've just got that really nice. <laughs> Incredibly rare birds yeah. here, but in great shape, beautiful shape. Yeah. 
Um, this one's really minty. It's really minty. So it's really minty. Yeah, yeah. Minty. Minty. Is that a new word? Is that a new minty. word going on? No, yeah. not most collectors. The other thing, by the way, these guitars from the fifties onwards, uh, the first guitars I think yeah. to have strap locks. Oh wow! Okay. Look, in yeah. fact, actually, no. I'm doing a job here. I'm actually unscrewing. You're unscrewing. I'm, I'm unscrewing the screw as well as the strap. Watch him! Watch him! Because he's going to take that with him. No, he isn't. He's, got, he's got his own at home. He's all right. But um, normally, what would happen when you did that is that the it wouldn't unscrew in its entirety from the body. Just right. the top would come off. And these these are meant to unscrew because then you screw okay. the strap on and you the the first strap. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so but, uh, don't need one of those grog bottle tops. And one of those grog bottle tops. All those ghastly things. That, you know. It, one of those, um, the, the clippy things, you know, really heavy duty. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, they used to be the rage in the early 90s. Um, they were awful, weren't they? Oh. Strap locks. Yeah, you used to have chippy guitar. And yeah, but the horrible. best thing, yeah, especially for the people who drilled them into their Les Paul Sunbursts. Ha, huh. yeah. Well, then you, then you had the other one, the clip on one, the plastic clip on ones. Oh, yeah. I mean, Gary Moore used to use them. Gary Moore had I mean, to Dario have made an interesting new one that kind of, it's plastic, oh, yeah, yeah, it sort of clips on, clips onto all kinds of old things. But the best one I've got is made by some seal company in the middle of the States. I think it's called Chord, and they make, they make straps for all kinds of instruments, violins and, 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 and saxophones and everything. And these are all kind of ballistic marbles. They're really nice and comfortable. But right. the best thing about them is that they've got this thing. It's like an ordinary, you know, you know that kind of keyhole shaped yeah. thing that goes on. So you go, click it on, go up. The little metal plate comes around and locks it. Right. And then you put vel the Velcro thing that pulls down over the top. And it's like a strap lock you can take off. And they're completely brilliant straps. And of course, what's so you could use the same strap on all your guitars. You can, and it's lockable, but it comes on and off, and it right. and it's soft. It's all oh, nylon right. and plastic, so it doesn't hurt your nice old guitars. Right. It's brilliant. So what's happened? They've discontinued it. So I'm actually thinking of you know uh, Bob signature signaling signaling some intent here, but actually Bob prob signature strap probably making. I mean, you're famous enough now. Some aren't you? You're famous enough now to have the Bob signature strap. <laughs> What do you reckon, guys? Uh, you can Thoughts answer. in the comments. I think you can answer that in the comments, exactly. You know, like, uh, bugger off. Some, some, uh, Airs and graces. Uh, some Bob paraphernalia. Airs and graces. No, but, but seriously, I mean, and, and actually, I might put the details of this strap, even if it is discontinued. I'll try and find them and put them on the super of this video because um, it's just bloody good. I mean, it's the strap I take out all the time because you know it's not going to let you down and it's quite easy to change. There you go. Anyway, enough strap wisdom. Have we covered the ground for today? We've covered it. I mean, we, this is a collection that we've, we've visited before, haven't we? And, and the, the owners very graciously invited us back. And uh, and we're really lucky that, you know, he's a great guy and he's letting yeah. us, you know. We are, absolutely. Yeah, they, absolutely. They yeah. and, I mean, the, jo the joke amongst me and my collector friends is that we no one's ever seen the bottom of this collection. We've, we've seen the sides and we've scratched another side today. And what a side it's been. All these red guitars, fantastic. But no one's ever seen the bottom. Will they? Who knows? So, it's goodbye from... Ramon, and it's goodbye from... Him. <laughs> Bob. Cheers. Later. <laughs>